Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Wayne Whitey Johnson. He's a World War II veteran and a veteran of the famed Flying Tigers. Sir, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Let's start at the very beginning. Where were you born and raised? I was born on a farm in western Minnesota, uh, just uh, about 20 miles east of the city of Ortonville, which is right on the border of Minnesota and North and South Dakota. When did you join the service? I joined um, the Army Air Corps on uh, December 8, 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor. And you had to get in a long line, as I recall, correct? Yes. Uh, probably started at about 4 o'clock in the morning, and there were probably three to 400 guys lined up to get into the recruiting station. Why did you join the Air Corps? Uh, I'd had a little bit of pilot time, and I, I didn't like walking that well. So I wanted to fly, and of course the uh, Army Air Corps told me not to tell anybody that I knew how to fly because they wanted to train me their way. What kind of flying had you done already? It was uh, uh, in a small uh, airplane. Uh, I did some crop dusting uh, in a, a Stearman. And, uh, I had a, uh, I think it was an Aranka, which was about a 80 horsepower engine and would cruise at about 110 or something like that. And were you 18 years old when you joined or were you a bit younger? I was, uh, I was 16 when I learned to fly that airplane. How about when you joined the service? Uh, I joined, uh, let's see, I was 20. 20, okay. Where did they send you for training? I went to uh, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri for uh, basic Army training. And then, uh, because I didn't have any college education, just high school, and they wanted college-trained pilots for some reason, uh, so they sent uh, me and several others up to um, Houghton Mining and Technology Co uh, College and uh, spent about, uh, I think, about six months there and uh, then went back to the traditional Army training. Now, you write a lot in your book about the, the different planes that you got to operate in training, and you, you certainly preferred some more than others. Yeah, I like the, uh, the Stearman. Uh, it was uh, hard to land and hard to take off because it had very narrow landing gear, uh, but it was a very good aerobatic airplane. And uh, once you got it in the air, very nice to fly. What about the P-40s? Uh, P-40 was really my favorite fighter. Uh, it, um, nothing could catch it in a dive. Uh, it wasn't quite as maneuverable as some of the Japanese planes. Uh, uh, so we were taught not to try to uh, get into a dogfight with them, to make a pass and dive away and then climb above them again. So that was the tactic we were taught, and it was a very successful one. Another plane that emerged was the P-51. What did you think of that one? Uh, that, of course, was the Cadillac of airplanes. Uh, easy to fly, very comfortable cockpit, wide, wide cockpit, um, and uh, had uh, very high speed. Uh, probably um, oh, 30 to 40 miles faster than the P-40 and uh, highly maneuverable. 
So uh, the only uh, shortcoming it had was uh, the coolant lines were in the belly. And uh, we did a lot of um, low altitude strafing of enemy air bases and troop concentration ships. And uh, so it was vulnerable from that standpoint because you got hit in a coolant line, uh, the engine would quit in about three minutes. And when I went down, uh, uh, that's what happened to me. I got hit in a coolant line. Uh, I think we were strafing on an enemy air base at, uh, I believe, at Canton at the time. How much did your crop dusting experience help you in training? Uh, most of the crop dusting I did was after my service. Okay. Uh, I just uh, flew a, a couple of times before I went in. So you really were learning from scratch? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that was very interesting in your book is that even before you were assigned to China, you were very interested in the Flying Tigers and what they were doing, right? Yes. And of course, um, most everybody uh, admired uh, General Chanel. And uh, so um, that was the wish of many to go to China to be able to fly uh, in Chanel's uh, command. And uh, of course, the Air Corps sent you not where you wanted to go, where they decided. But uh, fortunately, I got sent to China. What did you know about the Flying Tigers or General Chenault that made them so attractive? Uh, well, they were popularized, of course, in, uh, uh, in the press and in movies and, uh, and in books. Uh, so uh, uh, that was where I wanted to go. And how long were you in the service before you finally were sent to China? Uh, I think uh, probably about a year and a half or two at the most. But uh, we were pretty well trained by that time uh, in uh, learned fighter tactics. And uh, so to go to China and be under Chanel's command was what I hoped would happen, and fortunately it did. So what happened when you got there? Uh, I was there um, to went through India, and uh, there was a training field uh, near uh, Karachi in India, and probably spent uh, several weeks at that uh, training field where uh, combat experienced pilots uh, from China came down and uh, taught us uh, uh, combat tactics. And uh, then I went to, after that training, then went to Kunming, which was the headquarters of the uh, 14th Air Force Flying Tigers. And uh, then uh, the next day, I was sent out into a rather remote base in uh, southeastern China, which was located about halfway between uh, uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai. And, uh, that was where we staged out of. Uh, the, the Japanese um, didn't think we had enough range that we could, uh, from our base, get to either Hong Kong or uh, Shanghai. Uh, but uh, we had another little base uh, uh, about halfway between uh, that base and Shanghai, uh, where there were supplies of gas. And uh, so we could stage out of there, refuel, 
and, and get to Shanghai uh, uh, quite easily. And that was your first major mission? Yeah. The Shanghai Raids. What was the objective? Um, the Japanese, our intelligence, <coughs> uh, learned that uh, uh, the Japanese had brought in uh, a lot of airplanes uh, from uh, Formosa and uh, Taipei, Taiwan. And uh, they apparently were concerned about an American invasion of the China coast. Uh, so had uh, brought in uh, uh, over a hundred uh, fighters, uh, and they were all staged at that field, and they were lined up in beautiful rows because they didn't think we could have enough range to get there and back. And uh, we came in at about uh, 50 or 60 miles out which would be beyond their radar. And then we dove down to uh, treetop level. And uh, so uh, they did, had no idea we were coming because we were so low uh, below their radar. And uh, when we got to the field, to uh, the uh, airport that we were going to be strafing, uh, there were soldiers standing out in the fields uh, waving at us, uh, apparently thinking that we were Japanese coming in from Formosa until we start shooting, of course. And uh, that first uh, raid, we destroyed, uh, I think it was 94 uh, Japanese planes uh, on the ground and I believe uh, three in the air that was just taking off. So uh, it was probably the most uh, successful raid of the war, although we had a lot of more uh, strafing their air bases and, and their troop concentrations and uh, their shipping. So basically, my job uh, was al almost all low level. Wasn't always conducive to good health because they had the bad habit of shooting back at us. <laughs> but I survived. Sir, let's pause right there. We'll have much more with Wayne Whitey Johnson when we come back on Veterans Chronicles. We are back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus, honored to be joined in studio today by World War II veteran Wayne Whitey Johnson. He is a veteran of the famed 14th U.S. Air Force, also known as the Flying Tigers. And, sir, we were just talking about the Shanghai raids and how successful those were. What was that like as, as part of your first major mission? Uh, because we were well trained um, during uh, the combat, uh, uh, you try to stay calm um, and focus on what you were assigned to do. Uh, once uh, combat didn't last long, just a matter of minutes, really. And uh, when you left the target and started back home, uh, that's really when uh, uh, the emotions, I guess, set in. Uh, you um, realized that you were fortunate to get through it. Uh, a lot of guys uh, would uh, throw up and so forth uh, once you had the letdown. Then they had to clean their plane, right? It's Pardon? They had to clean out their cockpit then. Yes, yes. And the rule was that if you dirtied up your plane in any way, uh, you had to clean it up yourself. Now, you mentioned the great success of taking out 94 planes on the ground. 
and three that were taking off. So were the Japanese able to launch much of an air resistance? Uh, they did. Uh, for, they brought in more airplanes, and they did for uh, a while. Um, we uh, really found out that uh, the pilots that they brought in then uh, were not very well trained, and uh, so uh, they, if you got their leader, uh, they didn't seem to know what to do. They just sort of mill around and uh, were quite easy to uh, knock down. Did you have uh, a lot of experience in the in the dogfighting? Was that a big part of the training? Uh, in the training, it was, yes. Uh, actually, as I said, almost all of my missions were low level. Mm -hmm. um, and I only got in uh, to air, real aerial uh, combat just a couple of times. When that happens, are you trained to respond and attack and defend in specific ways? Or do pilots develop their own styles? Oh no, uh, we were we were trained by uh, highly experienced uh, combat pilots, and uh, in my case, because I went to India and then on to China, uh, all of the uh, training that I got from experienced combat pilots were guys that had flown combat in China. And, and knew very well the Jap uh, uh, tactics. You mentioned how often you were flying low-level missions. You also write about how, because you were at such a low level, there could be smoke coming up and, and other things that could be confusing or obscuring. Did you run into that a lot? Y yes. Uh, uh, obviously, when you started fires in there, on their planes and in their hangars and uh, other installations. Uh, there'd be a lot of fire, a lot of smoke. Uh, so n normally we were taught to just make one pass and then get out of there. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if we didn't get very much opposition, uh, sometimes our flight leaders would make uh, maybe one or two more passes. Once, uh, once they recover enough to start shooting at us, uh, then we'd leave. You also write about the fact that you often had a lot of time between missions, it seemed like. You were itching to get back in the air. There were stretches where you didn't have missions. How frequent was that? Uh, quite often. Uh, it'd be uh, seldom that you'd fly more than two or three missions uh, in one right after the other. And then uh, we might uh, uh, sit for weeks and do nothing. Uh, sometimes because we ran out of gas and, and ammo and waited for the cargo planes to bring in gas and uh, ammo and bombs. Uh, on the 51, P-51, uh, we could carry uh, two 500-pound uh, bombs. So if we had a, a short mission, then we could carry bombs. Otherwise, uh, we had two uh, 165-gallon tanks under each wing uh, that we could fly longer missions up to about four or four and a half hours. Your seat got pretty tired after that time. <laughs> Sir, let's pause again for a short break. We'll be right back with Whitey Johnson on Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by Wayne Whitey Johnson. He's a World War II veteran and a veteran of the 14th U.S. Air Force, known as the Flying Tigers. And, sir, one of the things that's 
unique about your story is that you decided to write it all down as it was happening. You kept a diary of your time in China. How did, how did you decide to do that? Um, a lot of the guys uh, kept diaries. We were instructed not to do so, uh, but uh, our commanders said, hey, go ahead and just don't carry it with you. And uh, so a lot of guys uh, would uh, keep a diary and record the events on a day-to-day -day basis. You didn't leave much out. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, uh, um, a lot of pages uh, from my diary got lost. I had sent it home and my, uh, one of my brothers had put them in a trunk uh, and, uh, and unfortunately the trunk was stored in the basement. Uh, so um, uh, some of the pages got uh, wet and soggy, were not uh, readable. But we were able to, uh, some people from the University of Minnesota uh, who, who were good at restoring books uh, took it and uh, were able to restore uh, probably about half of it, uh, which I was able to then use to record my memoirs. And the book is Whitey, which is your nickname, of Ooh, course. From wh uh, Whitey because of my white hair right. that I had from the time I was a little kid. And uh, uh, it was uh, Whitey from Farm Kid. I was born and raised on a farm uh, to Flying Tiger to Attorney. It's, it's and a there's three, four sections in the book. It's an incredible story, and it reminds me that you were a little taken aback when you first got to China because Tokyo Rose called you out by name. Yes. Tell that story. Uh, I think it was probably the first or second day that I was there, and uh, we used to listen to uh, music uh, from Japan because they uh, played uh, a lot of American music, and uh, uh, Tokyo Rose uh, would come on and talk about events, and uh, it uh, kind of set me back a little when she said, uh, uh, Whitey, uh, Whitey Johnson, uh, Lieutenant, something like that, uh, came to China, and he didn't go to last very long because our fighters, our superior fighter pilots, will knock them down. Uh, not too really encouraging news. <laughs> but we learned that she had a tendency to fabricate things. And you figured out that somehow they had spies getting personnel information, correct? Yeah. Uh, Chinese, of course, or most of the workers, or call them peasants, were very poor and they were easily to bribe. So uh, rather than uh, maybe one ball of rice a day, the Japs would uh, give them a couple balls and uh, so and, and use them as spies. Um, and they would uh, actually um, uh, steal our mission uh, orders off the bulletin boards. And uh, f some of them uh, finally got caught because they, we had uh, guards that watched the bulletin boards and if they came and ripped off a page, they'd report it to a Chinese general. And uh, the general um, uh, would shoot them on the spot. Uh, I, told, I asked one of the generals, I thought you were a democratic society and uh, give people a fair tri uh, trial. And he said, we do, we give them a fair trial and then we shoot them. <laughs> well, that spying also, you write about a friend of yours who was captured 
by the Japanese. And when he denied what his orders had been and they had the paperwork, he was beaten very badly. Yes. Um, he was one of the few uh, that was uh, taken prisoner. And uh, it, it happened to be on Christmas Eve of all days. And uh, so he spent the rest of the war as a POW prisoner of war. And uh, at first they had him in Hong Kong uh, in an old uh, British jail. They stripped him naked and uh, beat the hell out of him with uh, salt, salt, uh, salt ropes. And then uh, he was uh, put on a ship and sent to Japan and remained there for the rest of the war as a prisoner. And uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, Greg uh, Boynton uh, was also in that same jail. And uh, he apparently had uh, a number of packages of cigarettes uh, in his baggage. And so he'd uh, give the Jap guards uh, a cigarette. And uh, so he got the job as working in the kitchen and uh, spent the rest of the war working in the kitchen. Let's go back to uh, the combat. There's, you also tell the story, and I'm probably not going to say this word right, uh, about your actions at Lowan Ping. Yes. Tell us about what happened there. Uh, Lowan uh, Lo Ping uh, was a, a small base um, located uh, about halfway between our headquarters at Kunming and, uh, and uh, Shanghai, and, and probably about equidistant between uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai. And so uh, we were able to uh, strike uh, both uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai uh, Japanese bases from that base. They had a huge um, uh, Japanese uh, army, uh, uh, about uh, uh, 50 miles uh, from our base. But uh, because we would uh, go out and strafe them quite often, uh, they just sort of stayed put. And so they never uh, bothered to raid our base. Uh, so we were uh, uh, quite secure there. Uh, the Japanese uh, uh, did uh, come over, not during the day because they'd get shot down, uh, but they would come over at night. And uh, our fighters were not equipped very well to fly at night. Uh, but they came over with their bombers and uh, dropped uh, bombs on our uh, installations and our barracks. And uh, uh, we would get uh, warnings uh, from uh, 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 Chinese uh, spies that were at those Japanese bases. And uh, they let us know uh, when uh, the bombers had taken off so that uh, we could get to the uh, uh, trenches, the slit trenches, uh, which were um, a narrow, uh, narrow trenches, probably about two feet wide, so a man just could fit in them, and uh, they were about um, four or five feet deep. So when there was a, a raid, we'd run and jump on those and sit there till the raid was over. Um, Fortunately, they weren't accurate enough to hit our trenches. Get to in the trench. There's a nice picture of you standing in the trench uh, in your book. Um, you, you mentioned earlier on about being in a P-51 that went down. 
What do you want to share about that? Uh, as I said, the um, uh, coolant lines um, for the uh, coolant used in the radiator uh, were in the belly. And so at low level of 51 was very vulnerable to ground fire. And since uh, we did a lot of low level strafing, um, uh, I got hit uh, in a coolant line. And uh, of course I could tell that first, I could hear the uh, shots hitting my wings. And, uh, and then immediately the temperatures started to go up. And so uh, I knew I had been hit in the coolant. So I had enough speed, uh, probably going about uh, 400 or 450. Uh, so I could have climbed up uh, to eight or 10,000 feet quite safely. Uh, but, um, and then bail out. Uh, but uh, the Japs were shooting guys in parachutes. Uh, so um, if we got hit, uh, we felt it was safer uh, to uh, belly the plane in, get it in on wheels up, than it was to try to climb in and bail out. And uh, Chinese uh, uh, natives, peasants we call them, were very good about rescuing us. Uh, if they could uh, get a five minute uh, head start on the Japanese troops, uh, uh, they would save us. So you had good interaction with the Chinese people overall? Yes, yep. Yeah. Um, it was um, quite a, a change uh, in diet because uh, we didn't have any American food. Uh, we, sometime later we got the sea rations, but uh, at first uh, we were fed in uh, by uh, Chinese mess halls. And so we just learned to eat the Chinese food. You mentioned earlier that your plane was in combat a few times, and you talk about that in the book, and you were fortunate enough to, uh, on some of those occasions to be, to be with one of the great aces of the Pacific Theater, correct? Uh, I didn't shoot down five airplanes in a day that would make you technically an ace, uh, but uh, overall, uh, once I got in the air and many more on the ground, uh, but they didn't co count uh, uh, planes on the ground destroyed. Uh, I probably destroyed uh, dozens on the ground. You tell the story in the book about riding with, I can't remember the last name, it might be Elder. Was his last name Elder or Older, who was one of the great aces oh, of the war? Oh, uh, a Charles Older. He became a judge after the war on the Manson trial. Yes. And gained a lot of fame there. And uh, he was uh, one of the commanders, really a nice guy and great to fly with. And he had many kills, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, he was not the top ace. Tex Hill was the top ace. But I think he had, uh, I believe, 16. Uh, aerial kills. That's amazing. <laughs> so one of the things you also write about in the book is when General Chenault resigned about a month before the atomic weapons were dropped and that was very frustrating to those of you serving in the theater, correct? Yes. Um, Ar uh, Arnold, uh, who was the Air Force commander, and uh, Marshall uh, was the Armed Forces Commander. Um, both uh, uh, disliked Chenault because uh, uh, he would kind of avoid going through channels. 
and if he wanted something, uh, he would go directly to Roosevelt. And of course, Roosevelt uh, loved him, so whatever he asked Roosevelt for, uh, he would generally get. So if we ran short of uh, gas, supplies, ammo, uh, he'd get on a plane and go to Washington. And a few days later, supply ships would come in. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back with more conversation with Whitey Johnson on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. Honored to be joined today in studio by Wayne Whitey Johnson, veteran of World War II and the famed Flying Tigers. Sir, we had talked a little bit in the previous segment about your belly landing of the P-51 and being rescued uh, by the Chinese. Talk about that a little bit more and what it was like to know you were going down after being shot. Um. I had uh, enough speed, as I said, I was going about 450 miles an hour when we were strafing, uh, coming from a dive. So I had plenty of speed to uh, climb up to a safe altitude and bail out. Uh, but I didn't want to do that because the Japanese uh, had the rather bad habit of shooting guys in parachutes. Uh, so I didn't want to give them that uh, risk and um, so I saw what I thought was a nice straight uh, road that I could uh, safely uh, belly land on at least and uh, looked like from the air that was lined with uh, bushes on each side. Well just as I started to round out uh, to land I realized that uh, those were not bushes at all, they were huge boulders. And the road was so narrow that uh, when I leveled off the land, uh, it, the wings uh, caught on those boulders. And it, uh, it ripped off uh, both wings as I skidded along. And then uh, the plane, uh, uh, turned a little, and it hit the tail and uh, ripped the tail off. And uh, then it spun in the other direction, and the engine hit the boulders, and it ripped the engine off. Uh, and then it kind of straightened out and skidded along just in the cockpit uh, for some distance, um, maybe a couple hundred feet or so, and then. Uh, came to a stop and uh, there were some uh, Chinese uh, fellows uh, in the field uh, working in the rice field and uh, they saw me uh, crash and uh, they uh, ran over and uh, pulled me out of the wreckage. And this one guy probably was uh, five feet tall and maybe weighed 100 pounds, but tougher than nails. And uh, he put me on his back. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and I ran uh, uh, for miles to get away from the uh, Jap troops that were coming down the hill. And, uh, when they got, uh, looked like they were getting too close, uh, they put me in this uh, pond nearby. And it had uh, bamboo uh, shoots, and uh, those were uh, hollow, uh, probably an uh, inch and a half or two inch uh, in diameter in hollow. And uh, so they uh, uh, tossed me in this little lake and uh, they would signal when the Jap uh, troops got close and uh, letting out the kind of funny little whistles. And then they told me to dive under the water 
and uh, put this reed in, in my mouth and let it stick up so that I could survive under the water. And uh, I laid there for, and uh, one time I, I saw this uh, Jap boot and uh, he was not, he stepped into the water and the water was deep enough so it went over the top of his boot so he he backed up but uh, his uh, boot uh, was probably within uh, uh, two feet of me. Hmm. If he'd uh, step one more step, uh, he'd uh, stepped on me but fortunately he didn't get his, want to get his boot wet I guess so he backed out and um, I stayed there till uh, dark and uh, then they came and fetched me out and uh, we uh, traveled all night um, for uh, mostly during the night at the day uh, they'd hide me away somewhere and uh, it took uh, I think about uh, three days uh, to get back to uh, safe territory. So uh, it was a kind of an exciting experience, but I survived. <laughs> what were you thinking through all this? To get back safely. Were you starting to get worried? Pardon? Were you worried at any point? Uh, oh, yeah. Scared as hell. I bet. Talk about the end of the war. Did you know that the end was in sight before we actually dropped the bombs? Yes, uh, we, um, we were staging uh, in eastern, very far eastern China uh, to join uh, uh, the attack on Japan. Uh, we had enough range in a 51 that we could uh, fly from the coast above Shanghai uh, to uh, Okinawa, and, um, which I think was about a four or five hour flight, and that was just as long as we could stay in the air. Uh, but um, we heard that uh, that uh, our country had uh, some very high-powered uh, explosives of some type. Uh, we didn't know what they were, of course, but uh, some of the guys uh, uh, had learned that they were very high on testing very high explosives. So it was a surprise to us, of course, when they dropped the bomb that wiped out so much of Tokyo, Tokyo and some of the other cities. And uh, we knew from what the uh, Japanese radio was saying, uh, English speaking, uh, that uh, they were prepared to surrender because they didn't want their country destroyed. So when they surrendered, what was the reaction like? Uh, a great relief, I guess. Uh, when we knew the war was over, uh, we knew that uh, the risks we had been taking, we wouldn't have to take anymore. And uh, we then knew we were going to get safely home, or we're pretty sure we would. Your next phase in life, in our last few minutes here, your, your next phase in life, uh, becoming an attorney and a, and a record-setting city attorney. Uh, what, did, what did you do after the war? Tell our viewers and listeners. Uh, I got out of the uh, service in uh, uh, November of 1946, and uh, I signed up for college at uh, Fargo, North Dakota uh, to start on the 1st of January or 2nd of January. 
and uh, Hearts Fargo uh, was a pretty cold spot. I think uh, the day that I got there was about 40 below. And of course, I'd been down in Texas where it was nice and warm. So that was a bit of a shock. And uh, but I liked uh, I liked college, and uh, because of my experience flying P fifty ones, the North Dakota Air Guard, uh, Air National Guard, had gotten fifty ones. So uh, they got a hold of me and asked if I would come back into the guard and. Uh, help uh, uh, train new pilots, uh, which I did for two years while I was going to college. And uh, because of my low-level experience, um, they found out about that, and so I was offered a job doing uh, crop dusting. Uh, so I, I did uh, crop dusting uh, for a while while I was in college. And that was, uh, I liked it. It was fun. You could fly low, come over a field, you'd have to go under the telephone and the power lines, and then climb back up and take another pass. Uh, very it was interesting. Definitely. How did you get into the law? Uh, there was a um, a fellow from uh, Oxford, Mississippi, in my tent, uh, who had started law school, and of course he kept talking about uh, his interest in the field of law and uh, what he had started to learn about it, and uh, so I became interested in that. So uh, as soon as I got out of the service, uh, I signed up uh, at college. I uh, took uh, pre-law at, uh, at Fargo. Uh, it was then called the Agricultural College, or we call it the Cow College. and. Uh, then I went down to uh, uh, transfer to St. Paul uh, to a law school there, and uh, that's where I I, I uh, was admitted to the uh, Minnesota uh, bar in uh, 1952. and practiced law from then on for 50-some years. And uh, I'd helped um, legally organize uh, two communities and uh, became their city attorney. And I uh, held uh, that job in each of those uh, small towns, really, uh, for over 50 years, and uh, that uh, set a record of uh, the longest serving city attorney, uh, not only in Minnesota, but in the United States. The only uh, thing wrong with it was that they didn't pay me any longevity pay for it. <laughs> what were the towns? Pardon? What were the names of the towns? Uh, Silver Bay, Minnesota, and uh, Beaver Bay, Minnesota. Uh, Beaver Bay was just a small town of a hundred or a couple hundred population. And uh, Silver Bay, uh, which was a new uh, town uh, built by the mining company who had set up a mining process plant there. And uh, they contacted me to organize uh, Silver Bay into a legal uh, city. 
And uh, so, of course, they appointed me as their city attorney, and uh, I served uh, that city also for over 50 years. Last question, Mr. Johnson. Back to your time in the service. What are you most proud of? I guess that I survived. And the, the fact is that I d did fly a lot of interesting missions. And I uh, met uh, people that became uh, lifelong friends. It's quite a legacy. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, and thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Wayne Whitey Johnson, World War II veteran and a veteran of the 14th U.S. Air Force, the famed Flying Tigers. I'm Greg Corumbus, reporting for Veterans Chronicles.